Good morning. This is Math 261, Multivariable Calculus Delta College, Tuesday, October 12, class session. And we have our topics for this morning. Basically, tangent planes, linear approximation. Every way that we can understand the word linear at this time, we're not fully prepared to know the full power of linear. You know, that might be some additional classes for you sometime, somewhere, depending on your discipline or your interests. But we can make powerful use of the word linear here in vector calculus. We just may not be ready to understand the full implications of linear. And then one of your favorite rules from calculus one, chain rule. Of course, you learn the chain rule in one dimension only. Now we're going to tell you the true nature of the chain rule. Very powerful rule for relating rates that depend on other rates. Now, recently we set your exams back to you. And uh, I think in general, you did a very good job on the exams. But in my mind, good job is not the number you got on the exam, good job is, you know, what you did, the work you did on the exam. So I think you're all making some very excellent progress. Uh, I also last night returned your most recent homework problem to you and updated your grade reports. Our most recent homework problem was from 4.1 and you submitted that previously and uh, after I graded your exams and moved on to help another class with exams, I just hadn't read that problem for several days. So I read through that problem last night and posted it. That was a difficult problem. It really was a difficult problem. And I'm not fully satisfied with my solution to the problem. I don't think I have a very good solution to the problem. But I invite you to look at it and see if you can improve on it or if it gives you other insight. I want to say this, because you all had good stabs at it, but here's two things I noticed when I was reading your papers. One, you worked hard at trying to make the equations do what you needed them to do or what you wanted them to do. And in fact, in some sense, I encourage that because I said, well, look, we know, or we have a strong feeling about what's happening in this problem, that the level curves are parabolas, but the equations seem kind of messy. So sooner or later, if, if our feeling is correct, the equations have to bear out the truth. But there's more than one way to attack the equations. So you did, dive heavily into the equations. I got to remember, even if you're looking at my paper, I have to be recording the paper. So excuse me, I just put this paper on the recording. So you dived heavily into the equations and sometimes coming closer or, or less close to the resolution. But don't forget the visuals. Now, when you're doing the level curves, you came close to finding the parabolas with your complicated equations. I think uh, I saw one really nice solution that was very, very close to finding the parabolas. And then the trace equation, really the trace function there was a function of one variable. And so in both of those problem parts, the instructions were to describe. And I wanted you to describe them with equations, but I also wanted you eventually to physically describe them because you knew what they were. So look at the solution I posted. You can classify and describe things with pictures, not just with formulas, but Sometimes the pictures do a better job than formulas. Sometimes the formulas do a better job than the pictures. Like I said, I'm not entirely satisfied with my solution. You can read it 
and compare it and see what you think. The second point I want to make about the homework that I read from 401 is I appreciate the fact that you're diving into Mathematica, some deeper, not as deep, but you really need to continue to do that because you're going to need some tool to visualize and verify what we're doing inside this class, outside this class, whatever field you're pursuing, you're going to use software applications to visualize and verify what you're doing. Now, in mathematics and in engineering, the two leading software packages that are out there right now are MATLAB and Mathematica. And any time that you spend in either one will reward you in both because you could move from one to the other if you understand the logic of what these languages are presenting. Uh, in this programming side of things, well, that's not so clear. You know, you had your age of the dinosaurs where the dinosaurs ruled the earth, right? And uh, I might compare that to the age of C++ or the age of C, the dinosaur languages that ruled the earth. Still very, very useful, but then people moved on to object-oriented languages. And then they said, this is the ultimate object-oriented languages will rule the earth. You know, things like Java and modifications of C plus, C sharp, Microsoft's devil spawn. But now the programming languages you're gonna looking at uh, are a little looser and a little more flexible. So if I was recommending two languages to you right now, besides Java and C plus plus, which still are very large monsters that could accomplish great tasks. One of the most exciting languages right now are Python and R. And these languages have a lot of similarities to MATLAB and Mathematica. They're, they're kind of function-based, functional-based. What can you do with this? What can you do with that? And they, all four of these, have their emphasis on data, on presenting, organizing, analyzing, and refining data. And from more from the engineering point of view, more from the statistics point of view, as I go down this list, but uh, you, can't, you can't say anymore, oh, I'll do that, but I won't use a computer. I'll just do it with my fingers and toes. That just doesn't work anymore. So in this class, you're diving into Mathematica, and that's going to seriously pay off. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because in some of my solutions and more of my solutions, let me share a screen with you, I'm looking at the exam solutions right now. Uh, I've posted how I did something in Mathematica. So these are the exam solutions. Uh, problem number one, I, I really liked your solutions often more efficient than mine. My solution here was more of a construction solution, like let's construct the plane, let's construct the circle. But sometimes you're presenting a more efficient way to do this. This was problem number two, a very difficult problem, trying to see what was happening intersecting these two cylinders. It's kind of interesting that you could have two things that are so simple, cylinders, just based on circles sliding up and down an axis. And that intersection could be so difficult or so obnoxious. So more and more, you know, apart from doing the problem here, and I probably wrote a little more than I needed to write. 
And there is multiple ways to do this problem. So sometimes you accomplish the parameterization different ways than I did. And I thought that was interesting. Parameterization with the tr trigonometric functions had a certain efficiency to it. But more and more, I'm posting with the answers, the Mathematica notebooks, not just the pictures like, oh, picture, how did they do that? No, here's the pictures and the commands I use to construct these pictures. So here's one way to visualize the intersection of those cylinders. And then the smallest ball that could encompass the intersection and the largest ball that could fit inside the intersection. And you do not look at these commands and say, oh, I could not have invented that command. What you do is you look at these commands and learn how to assemble them piece by piece. So when I have options like plot style or mesh style or axes label or axes or thickness or opacity, this is the nature of these modern tools and modern languages built on functions and functions get you off the ground very, very fast. Let's do something. And then loaded with a massive number of options. And so when you get to that idea that function is my basic unit, data is my basic unit, and then I want to do things to the data with the functions, that's a very efficient way to look at things. And it means you will progress, you will get more powerful when you learn more options to the functions. So I wanted to present these pictures and the commands that did that so you could look at how I did them. But don't look at a command as a list of long things that you don't know how to do. Look at the command one at a time. What are the arguments? What is this option that he added? What is this option that he added? And slowly you'll get stronger and stronger at using the language. There's a very beautiful picture here and I can blow it up a little bit. I don't have serious blowing up, but two cylinders, here's the ball inside it. Two cross sections I did in red and then the curve that accompanies the intersection. And there was a little surprise in that problem exactly what that curve, what ball it took to encompass that curve. Okay, so I want to do another Mathematica demonstration for you in a second. So I'm really saying, let me go back to my paper. I'm really saying you dive in to the language and it's gonna pay big, big dividends. And I'll try to post with my solutions more and more of how I made that picture or how I did that. I want to share how I created some graphics for this problem from homework 401. So I'm not very impressed with how I wrote the answer, but I did have some graphics that I developed that helped me see what was happening. So let me open up that Mathematica notebook for you if I can find it, here it is. And uh, I can't remember whether I posted this on our site or not. Maybe I should post this on our site. I did, in the solution I posted, I did post the PDF of this notebook in the document solution that I posted so you could read that, but maybe I should post the actual notebook. Let me go and share screen. Let me bring up Mathematica. So uh, I don't know if I can blow this up right now. I don't know if blowing it up is what I want to do. I want you possibly to read this and you can read it in the solution. And if I put the notebook up there, you can execute it and play with it yourself. But the idea is here, not that I wrote down a lot of complicated things on the first run. No, I wrote down the things that I needed to assemble a picture and I slowly added 
options to them. So first of all, we have the function right here that was given to us. And then I want to plot that surface. So I chose parametric plot to plot that surface because I was making that surface out of parabolas. Um, you could have gone straight ahead with plot 3D, which is what most of you did. You'd get a better picture with plot 3D if you use this option sometimes called plot points. Plot points tells Mathematica how many points to sample when it makes a drawing. So uh, now plot points is can be very dangerous or expensive. If you get up to 100 or 200 plot points, that can take some serious time. Don't overdo it there. But 50 plot points, maybe up to 100 plot points, you can really add some clarity. Then I have the mesh functions, the mesh, the axes, labels, the box ratios, all these things are decorations after I plot the basic service. Then I wanted to make the level planes, the planes that slice that surface, but I wanted to go one step further in this problem than you were asked to do. I wanted to make an animation that showed the level plane able to go up and down and the trace plane able to go forward and backward. So I made those into functions of parameter A and parameter B. The contours are going to be the physical intersection curves of the surface and the plane. So I worked out those equations. And this is the style I worked out those equations in the solution by hand. And then I placed them into here to make my parameterization. Likewise, the trace curves. But then I wanted to, so to speak, remove the contours, remove the traces and lay them on the table, lay them on the two-dimensional plane so I could see them as they worked. And so I created two more functions just to draw the level curves in the plane and the trace curves in the plane, functions of one variable. And then I used, let me get rid of this distracting graphic for a second. I used the show command to put several surfaces and elements together. And I used the manipulate command to create an animation based on the A and B. So just look at the show command here for a second. Show command starts and stops on this line and it's gonna show the surface the level plane, the trace plane, and the intersections of the level plane trace plane with the surface. They're called the contours and the traces. But then side by side with that show, I'm gonna draw the two dimensional level curves in the plane and the two dimensional trace curves in the plane. And the manipulate command has two parameters because I'm allowing you to change two things. And uh, don't, Look at this pie right here. That's not essential. I could tell you why I inserted that another time. But this is going to create an animation of three images side by side. And what I have here is I could change the position forward and backward of the trace plane. Now, again, this is computation inside a video being delivered over the internet. So it's not going to be smooth. But what you can see here is every time I move the trace plane, I get the different traces over here in blue. Uh, I can make these pictures resized. I could blow this up right here. But you see the traces on the surface right here. And you see that I can move that trace plane forward and backward. That's an interesting moment. See, that's coming down to a cusp right there. And then shortly after that, it's going to move on and become an asymptote. So, this is just a little bit of extra work. And you know you can play with this. I didn't expect anybody to produce this yet, but the little bit of extra work 
makes this much more visual and gets me to follow the trace curves more clearly. This first portion where the trace curve had no discontinuities, uh, some people picked up on that, some people didn't, but that, that's an important part of this. Let me move this to the very back of the picture. And let me look at the level curves with this red plane. And the level curves are rising and falling and cutting this surface into two parabolas, cross section of two parabolas. There's one moment where the cross section is only one parabola, but I'm not displaying that here. But you can see the two parabolas rolling in and rolling out. Again, I know the picture is jerky because we're making a lot of compromises here to present this. Okay, so don't neglect the pictures. Now, pictures alone would not be a solution to this, but the pictures here are adding powerful visual evidence for your solution. So look up the manipulate command, play with it someday, and I could show you the surfaces. For this reason, uh, and you can't see it here too well, but what I chose to do was make the surface very nondescript, transparent and gray, and make the plane stand out, also transparent red and blue, and then make the intersection curve stand out more, solid, thick, red, solid, thick, blue. So, you see on the intersection planes, I removed all mesh. You'd go back and look at the commands and see mesh equals none. And the only mesh I have here is the level curves. And that was done in a special way too. That was done right here, where I put the meshes in the third variable and the Z variable. And then I gave a specific list of messages, uh, excuse me, a specific list of contour heights, meshes, with a command that creates lists called table. So I'll look up the table command. That can be useful when you have to repeat a long list. Uh, one more image that we will look at here is just showing these three things individually. Now here's the surface itself alone. Here's the surface with the plane y uh, z equals two. Here's the surface with the trace y equals three. So I can make each of these larger or less large if you wanted to see them, but uh, you can play with this yourself. But the surface is kind of gray, nondescript in the background that I'm highlighting the planes and the intersection curves. I am not a good user of Mathematica. And if you go to, whoops, for some reason, I'm getting attacked by low battery mode. Hang on, let me make sure I got this going on. There we go. For some reason, I didn't have a power strip switch done. My apologies. I'm not a good user of Mathematica in this sense that I sometimes work too hard to produce a nice image. I'm, I'm sure someone who's more uh, fluent in Mathematica, excuse me. Uh, I can do that, thank you, Tolu. I, I can give you some information on that, thank you. Someone who's a little more schooled in Mathematica could probably accomplish what we've accomplished here much more efficiently. But that's part of learning the language. That's part of learning the language. So dive in, experiment, play with this, and slowly you can make better and better images. OK, I'm going to unshare this and then make some other comment and address the question in the chat. And then we'll move on. So let me unshare. Let me put that Mathematica notebook away. Let me quit that Mathematica notebook so I can clear my memory. If you're doing busy stuff in the Mathematica notebook, 
and you want to open another one, you could quit it just to reset any variables you have laying around. Okay, so you understand the speech here? You need to dive into these tools. You need these tools. Uh, the two most exciting tools to me right now are Python and R. I'm going to be giving a class in R in the winter semester. Uh, I would. I have more things that I'd like to learn than I have time to learn them. I don't think I'm going to dive into MATLAB myself because Mathematic and MATLAB are kind of interchangeable. If I know one, I know the other. But these are tools you need to invest in. And invest, I mean your time. You can have them for free. R free, Python free, Mathematica, site license at any reputable college you attend. Same thing with MATLAB. Okay, so let me see if I can address this question, uh, not an interruption, don't worry, and see what I can say about this. Uh, the question is, can you briefly explain what you want for our image in 4.2 homework part B? So let's pull this up so we're all on the same page. And this is 4.288 alt. Uh, People get dropped off and come back in, no problem. Let me look up 4288 alt and share it with everyone. So we have this function of two variables. I'll share the screen. We have this function of two variables right here. F of xy is xy cubed over the quantity 2x squared plus y to the six. And we've given you a warning about limits in multiple variables and that you can sometimes have a hard time establishing them. Lots of things could go wrong. That's a little bit about what the theme we're gonna talk about today. Things can go wrong because there are so many different directions you can approach a point from with a limit. Not only many different directions, but many different ways many different curves that you can approach point on. So if you make a wise choice about the curve that you approach the origin on for that function, you will not have a hard time producing two different limit values. We demonstrated that on a similar problem based on squares in the lecture last time. So here, how do we create an image of this surface with an appropriate parameterization to show that you can have infinitely many different limit values. And then a side question this is a calculational question. Uh, is it okay to ask how many limit values you can have at the origin? Or if not, how many, uh, what kinds of limit values, what range could you have? If you admit that you can have more than one limit value at the origin, then the next question is, do you have 100? Do you have 1,000? Do you have infinitely many? And if so, where are they? Over the whole real line, just over an interval? So that's more of a calculational question that's related to A, related to the paths that you chose in A. But create an image of the surface with an appropriate parameterization. That's more of an open-ended question like, what kind of image can you make for me? And I will give you a demonstration, but not on this function, but close enough to this function that it may be useful to you. So let me pull up Mathematica. Let me go back to the function or close to the function that we used in the last class. This won't be exactly the function we used in the last class, perhaps. But let's make it close. Let's blow this up so you can read this. Let's say f of x underscore x underscore comma y underscore close, defined to be uh, 
x squared times y. The space makes multiplication in Mathematica, but if you're nervous about that, put in an asterisk. Divided by, let's say, uh, x squared plus y to the fourth. Let me think for a second if that is the equation I want. And I think rather not. I'm basing this off a problem in 4.1. And maybe I should just look up the problem in 4.1 so I don't screw it up. The problem that we talked about last time in 4.1, which was, zoom, zoom, zoom. Or 4.2, excuse me. You're asking a question about 4.2. It was 4289. I, I almost wrote that nicely. It was x4, y squared. Okay, so I put this function inside Mathematica now. Oh, okay, excuse me. I have to share the Mathematica window. You're right. Wrong window. Hang on. There we go. Okay, you haven't missed anything. I've only defined the function. So let's try a straight ahead plot on this. Plot 3D. You suspect something is wrong. I use indentation and I'm gonna plug in f of x comma y. No underscores because I have defined the function when I executed that line. I have to give an x and y range here. So let's just be, uh, Mellow at first, let's say minus two to two. And this will address your question, just hang on. And this is like the most bare bones plot I can make, right? Just function domain. And there's the function right there. And now I see that there's some kind of pinching at the origin. I even see that I could approach the origin on different paths. One is a mountain ridge, one is a valley. I sense, and we made this comment last time when we did this, that somehow parabolas are central in this picture. But this is not a really excellent picture because it's getting a little bumpy and so on and so forth like that. That's why I suggested to you to look up the option called plot points. So let's try pumping this up with plot points. Now let's go for 50. Much smoother, but still you can see some jaggedness here in the center. So I could super pump this up with 100 points or maybe 200 points. I might be afraid of how long that would take the machine. I don't think a hundred would be, but five or six seconds. Well, it's two seconds. Still jagged. I'm encouraged to try 200 points. The machine responds within five or six seconds. And really this surface has sharp definition now. I might even like to say mesh equals none to just focus on the surface and not on the grid line. So there's a piece of paper that's been violently pinched. Maybe some kind of cosmic origami going on here. But I haven't got rid of this strange zone at the origin, but I have enough to know that I don't think a limit exists and I think parabolas are the key. So if parabolas are the key to examining the limit, why not parabolas are the key to drawing the function? So let's try to draw the function in another way. Let's use parameter, parabolas as the parameterization. So instead of plot 3D, let's try parametric plot 3D. 
indent. And let's plot a list of three-dimensional points. Now, if I say x comma y comma f of x comma y, I will produce the same result as I did above. If I borrow the same domain, excuse me, and paste it right in here. All I'm doing with parametric plot here is plotting the same function the same way, but naming points that I should plot, and I'll get the same result. That original pinched surface. I won't improve this with the mesh and the plot points yet, but if parabolas are the key, and I suspect y equals x squared, 2x squared, 3x squared, those are the key parabolas, then what I should do is replace the y with kx squared. Now remember, when I write kx squared and read no space, Mathematica thinks it's a new variable called kx. So I want k times x squared or k space x squared. And then I replace the y with k space x squared. And now I am parameterizing the surface based on parabolas, but not x and y anymore. Now it's x and k. So I should run the k's from a certain value to a certain value. Let's see what happens. The first result is not desirable. Oh, now I am drawing the surface with parabolas. I magically got a much better resolution at the origin using parabolas. But I got this thing skating away like some kind of weird manta ray. I need to control this box. I think I need to control this box. So let's control the box with plot range. And let's control all aspects of this box, like the X, Y, and Z aspects. I thought the original minus two, two is good. Now we're spending considerable time on this, but I don't think it's, I think it's time well spent. Uh, here's something else you could investigate. It's called, excuse me, let me make that a little bit larger for you. It's called box ratios. Box ratios, aspect ratios at various times. But notice how my box is going to be four by four by two. So I could tell Mathematica to display the units one to one by saying four by four by two, or I could adjust it some other way. Let's see how this works out. Okay, now it's a little nicer, a little nicer, but I see what's missing right here is like, oh, I've only drawn some of the things. Okay, so let's pump up the parabolas to superpower. Let's say not k equals minus two to two, but k equals minus 20 to 20. Ooh, now I did fill in a lot more of the surface. But the amount of things I was asking Mathematica to compute, it didn't have enough data points, so it got the jitters right here. OK, this is where plot points could come in. I could give Mathematica more points to plot with. Let's try 50. Uh, that is remarkably smoother. Let's try 100. That is definitely smoother. And let's get rid of this mesh. This is not convenient for me right now. I think I'd like to do mesh by contour lines, but I wouldn't do that yet. But um, let's do mesh equals none. Notice, by the way, that when I have plot points of 100, every time I add an option, it has to crank that calculation again. So if you want to add options and see the effective options, you could dial down the plot points. And then when you're ready for the finished product, you could jump to the 200 plot points or something. 200 plot points, looks like it takes about five or six seconds right there. Now that is a very smooth picture. Let's compare it side by side with the other picture. Uh, the other picture wasn't too bad. It's got this little gap at the origin. Is there a gap right here? Yes, but it's only exactly at the origin. It's even very hard to see in this image. 
Now, is there anything that's undesirable about this image? Say, yeah, like, how am I ever going to fill in the rest of these parabolas? Uh, I am afraid to do this, but okay, let's not, I was going to say 200, let's say 50 to 50, regardless of how many parabolas I do. Now, get very tall, thin parabolas, right? But uh, I'll never complete that gap with this method. See, I'll always have a gap there. Maybe if I pumped it up to 10,000 parabolas, but do not do that. I don't think you should do that. But what I could do is I could lay another parameterization of the surface on top of this to kind of cover that gap. Now, I will not demonstrate that. I'll let you try to demonstrate that if you like. But uh, as, as we go back to your problem, what you want to do is everyone's going to agree that as I approach the origin on two different paths, I'm going to get two different values. Can you actually draw those curves for me now on this image? Whether or not you fill in the parabola gap, I guess I, that won't be my central question. But can you show me the parabola that approaches the origin and has this limit and the other parabola that approaches the origin and has that limit? You have many parabolas you could choose from. You could choose different heights but I'd like you to draw a curve on this, like you've drawn some intersection curves on previous ones, that actually shows me that you are coming to the origin and achieving different heights, different limits. Okay, the other question is like part C was, what's the uh, possible heights you could achieve? So from this drawing, I do see the possible heights I can achieve are, I, I do not think they are 0.5 to minus 0.5. I think it's a little more subtle than that, but certainly they're limited. I'm not going to fly in apparently and achieve a height of one or six or negative 10. So can you tell me exactly what heights you can achieve here? Not from the image, but from calculation. Okay, now again, this is not your problem. Your problem is based on cubics more but it, it's got similarities in this technique that I've demonstrated could work there. So that's the parametric plotting of a surface by choosing a smart parameterization. Okay, let me stop sharing this and then I'm gonna have to get back to work. Okay, thank you for the question. And let me get my desktop in order. And then we got that going on. Very good. Okay, so thank you. So now let's go on. So uh, I've given you the little proselytizing speech about making sure you dip into the powerful tools. We've talked about a weird limit example, which is gonna pay off in what we're gonna do today. So remember, the words that we are focused on in this chapter, limit, continuity, and the ultimate would be differentiability. That will be this slightly madding, maddeningly differentiability, slightly outside of our grasp from a total understanding point of view. But we can take you a long way. So what we want to do is replicate the success of calculus one with the tangent line. Tangent line was a fun, fun thing to do, but it was actually a powerful tool. And it was powerful because it gave you a tool for approximating things that were hard to calculate. I know you've all seen the idea from calculus. Oh, you've done this. Every calculus test has to include this question. It's part of the Calculus Teachers Guild. What's the square root of 101? Estimate this with a linear approximation. Okay. But since you have all kinds of tools that approximate values for you very easily. 
you're not necessarily impressed by the tangent line approximation to the square root function, which gives you a simple and relatively accurate estimate of square root of 101. But it is a good illustration of what tangent line means. So now I want to show you that tangent line, linear approximation, even differential, these are actually all the same animal. So I put one bubble around them. And whereas in your calculus one class, the tangent line or the linear approximation or even the differential, which you used most often in evaluation of integrals, these seem to be byproducts of differentiable of what a derivative was. You started in a sense with derivative and then you construct the tangent line, linear approximation or differential. For us, it's rather the reverse. If we want to understand what differential, differentiable or derivative is in a real valued function of a vector variable in the surface, then we really have to use these as our building blocks. Now, I'm gonna make a picture for you and we made a choice about how we were gonna use time earlier in the session. So I wanna be careful how I split this discussion up across the break. But let me remind you of one thing from calculus that will hold true for us today. Remember, differentiable, in plain English is smooth, continuous in plain English is no breaks, no holes, no breaks. And limit in plain English is predictable. These are not the mathematical definitions, but these are the words I want you to remember common words. And if something is smooth, then it clearly has no breaks in it. I'm talking about English word. And if something doesn't have any breaks or jumps in it, then it's clearly predictable. And that holds for the mathematical words as well. What you learned in calculus one for a function of one variable is that if a function is differentiable, then it must also be continuous. That's gonna be true for us today. And by the very definition of continuity, if a function is continuous, then it must be predictable. It must have a limit. I remember it's also very valuable to keep in mind from calculus one the idea that these things do not go the other way. Just because something is predictable doesn't mean it doesn't have any breaks in it. And the simple example is just, I can even give you a formula for the simple example, x squared minus four over x plus two. If you draw this, it's gonna be fully aligned except at two, where there'll be a hole punched in it, and then it'll continue on in its lineness. I'm not making a technical drawing here, I'm making a small schematic drawing. It's too small, I, I understand. So here's a function that's fully predictable at every single value of x, but it has a break in it at two. Likewise, just because something has no breaks does not mean it's smooth. And you know the classical example, is the absolute value of x. That's a function that exists everywhere. It's predictable everywhere. It's continuous everywhere at every point on the x-axis. The limit as you approach that point matches the value at that point, but it is not smooth because it has this point to it at x equals zero. So differentiability implies continuity, implies that limit exists but it is never the other way around. Just having a limit does not make something continuous. 
And just being continuous does not make something differentiable. Okay. So I wanna make sure that that's firmly in your mind before we go on. Okay, now let's make one more statement before we go to the break. And we'll do that in the form of the picture. Picture similar to one we did last time. So I'm gonna make a giant picture here. And I don't want too many details in this picture. So I'm gonna make the surface very simple. Just a single bubble pulls around with this little perspective trick. I give it a three-dimensional feel. This is the x-axis, y-axis, and the z-axis. Well, what I've done here is drawn a surface that appears to be quite smooth. So I wasn't trying to draw anything exotic. If I pick out a value of y naught and a value of x naught on the x and y axes, then that surface can cross at the point x naught, y naught. We're gonna draw this picture several times over again as we go along. And as I project that point onto the surface, by taking the function value, and remember this surface is a function like z equals f of x, y. Then I can have the height be f of x naught, y naught. I could call that z naught if I wanted to, but I don't want to clutter this drawing. And from here, for a different color, what colors can I use that I haven't used? use blue and purple, but blue and purple won't be a super awesome contrast. I will take this line where y equals zero fixed and I'd pop it up onto the surface, just project it onto the surface like a laser light show. And the same thing with this line where x equals zero fixed, I'll make this purple. And I'm not doing super drawing accuracy, I'm just doing mellow drawing accuracy. Last time we discussed the slope in the x direction and the slope in the y direction. If x is fixed, that's the slope in the y direction, that's the purple. If y is fixed, that's the slope as I travel on the x axis, that's the blue. And what we're looking at right now is the good case. What is the good case? The line that I project on the surface is smooth itself from holding X fixed, from holding Y fixed, smooth itself, that I have two legitimate and unique tangent lines at that point. And then you see that those two lines crossing at that point, it's believable that they construct a plane. And it's believable that that tangent plane, at least very close to this point, is very close to the surface. That's what I would call well-behaved. Now we made this statement last time. We even defined what mx and my should be. mx is the partial derivative of f with respect to x, which we defined with a difference quotient, but we can use all of our previous differentiable rules, different derivative rules on this, the partial derivative of f with respect to y is the slope in the y direction. But now we're faced with this question. If the surface is nice, it's believable that this process can create a tangent plane. And the tangent plane would be a good approximation to the surface. The tangent plane would be a good linear approximation. Remember, I said tangent plane and linear approximation are the same thing. 
that the tangent plane is a linear approximation. And a linear approximation, in this case, function of two variables, is a tangent plane. But we most recently, we did it for you right in front of your eyes, showed you a pinched surface, and a surface that was pinched at the origin. We showed you a couple surfaces that were pinched at the origin. And so the problem is there, what if there's some nasty pinching going on at that moment? What if the surface comes to a sharp point? Then can I hang a tangent plane on that? Well, possibly, but the problem is I might be able to hang more than one tangent plane on that point. And then I have a trouble deciding which one I should use. <laughs> and if I have two linear approximations, and they're giving me two different ways to approximate, maybe two different values of approximating near the point in question, then I don't have a legitimate linear approximation. And for us in the end, that is what differentiable is going to mean. Differentiable does not mean has a derivative. Remember, I've already disavowed you of that notion. Differentiable does not mean has a derivative. Differentiable in the end will mean has an excellent, unique, linear approximation. And that's what I want to evoke with this picture. And we're coming up to our limit. Uh, excuse me, we're coming up to our uh, break. <laughs> we're going to have a discontinuity in the lecture now. But differentiable means you can make one of these tangent planes and it's effective. And the problem is now, notice I did not say it has a unique and effective tangent plane. If we're talking about a function of two variables, then yes, I could write tangent plane in here. But if we're talking about a three variables, is it a tangent space? What happens about function of four variables? So I don't wanna pick any prejudice language for you, plane, space, hyperspace. So the word linear approximation is a little more general and powerful. Okay, we're going to come back from the break and do a practical demonstration of these, right? But in the end, differentiable is going to be, has a unique and effective linear approximation. And the problem with that is you haven't come to the journey in your mathematics life where you can fully describe this and prove it in full power with mathematics. So this is going to be the definition of differentiable for us. And it's not gonna be super precise. I can show you ways to check things that are differentiable precisely, but actually characterizing differentiable might have to wait until you have more mathematical tools or more advanced mathematical classes. Still right now, I can show you what differentiable means to all your practical needs. Okay, so this is enough warm up. I slightly overstep my time limit. So let's be a little bit generous right here. Let's come back at 910. And then let's do some practical calculation of tangent plane linear approximation and differential. I'm gonna mute my microphone, stretch my legs for a second. You're welcome to do the same. We'll be back in a few minutes.
Okay, we're back and we're ready to do an example of the one object that describes tangent plane, linear approximation, and differential all at the same time. So show you how tangent plane, linear approximation, differential are the same thing. And let's just pick an example out of the book and maybe we can make some nice, nice graphic out of it too. So key points, differentiable does not mean has a derivative because how do I know the derivative in the x direction, the derivative of y direction suffice to protect me from all the bad things that could happen to a surface. So these are not all the derivatives of f, so to speak. We'll talk about that later. Differentiable means has a unique and effective linear approximation. Now it's presented in many different ways in many different books. And so I'll make a comment about how your book presents the word differentiable. But right now, suffice it to say, you need some more tools and more time before you can give a full accounting of differentiable. And you would do that in future classes. You need some linear algebra. You need some matrix knowledge. It's not beyond you in any means. It's just you're not ready for it right now. So let's create the tangent plane I'm just going to pick a problem out of the book to uh, surface x cubed plus y cubed equals 3xyz. Uh, at the point one, two, and three halves. I don't know if this is going to be too simple or too complicated. We're going to have to find out. This is from section 4.4, problem number 177. Now they say go and solve this for z so you can create the tangent plane. And let's do that. Let's create the tangent plane with these two objects right here. And we're going to create the tangent plane by finding these two derivatives and by actually working out the standard of equation of a plane from those two derivatives. Now I'll state the equation of the plane before we actually show you how it constructed it, but you could write the equation of the plane as z minus z naught equal to partial derivative of f with respect to x, x naught y naught, times x minus x naught plus the partial derivative of f with respect to y at x naught y naught times y minus y naught. And in English, this says the change in z is equal to the rate of change in the x direction times the amount of change in the x direction plus the rate of change in the y direction times the amount of change in the y direction. This is the equation for a tangent plane. It's also, by the way, the equation for what people call the differential. But we use different notation when we write this. Differential means change. So change in z, you could represent as the differential dz. The little bit of change in z is equal to the rate of change of the function in the x direction times the little bit of change in x plus the rate of change of the function in the y direction times the little bit of change in y. Now this differential notation right here is a little more compact, a little more economical. You see I'm suppressing the x naught, y naught, z naught. I'm assuming that I'm taking the differential at a point, at a particular point. Now here, this point right here is one, two, and three halves. That is my x naught. 
y naught z naught. Okay. So tangent plane has to be at a point. Differentiable is a tool that you apply to specific points. That means you put in the x naught, y naught, you put in the x naught, y naught, you put in the x naught and y naught here and the z naught in here. But I just want to show you that differential and tangent plane are exactly the same animal. Now the third animal is called linear approximation. And this is a formal function presentation of the same object. Partial f, partial x, at x naught y naught, times change in x, plus partial f, partial y, at x naught y naught, times the change in y. But here I don't want to emphasize the change in z, I want to emphasize the approximation to the surface z. Remember, this is assumed that I'm talking about a surface z equals f of x comma y. Do you see that I haven't told you what z is yet here? But the problem in the book says you go ahead and solve for z. So we'll do that in a second. I can solve this equation for z, even if it causes problems when I divide by x and y, but we'll see what happens. So take the linear approximation, that's this portion, the derivative, the differential, excuse me, and add to that side the z naught. So I put a new equation here, turn this into a plus sign and say f of x naught, y naught. And that resulting object, z, which people usually call L of x comma y, that's called the linear approximation to the surface f of x, y. This is a tangent plane. It's literally the tangent plane equation with the z naught written on the right. So I don't want you ever to be spooked about these three words. They are the same thing. Now, when I go to more dimensions, I can't call it a tangent plane anymore. I got to call it a tangent space, a tangent object. Well, we'll worry about when it, that when it comes. But I can always use the word linear approximation, and I can always use the word differential. In fact, in all three cases, when I pump up and throw in more variables, what I do is I just add more terms. I could have a partial f partial w dw, partial f partial u du. To create dimensions extra, I just add change times rate of change products. And I can do that in all three of these examples. So let's do this one. And if you like, I'll present all three of these in this problem. So we say x cubed plus y cubed over xy. And now I have to create the partial f partial x and partial f partial y. I want to do this for you. I could simplify this possibly by creating two fractions. That might be easier to look at, but I want to do this for you as you see it with the quotient rule. Let's do partial f partial x with the quotient rule. And that is bottom times the derivative of the top. Now with the derivative of the top with respect to x, which is three x squared plus y cubed. No, three x squared and y cubed is a constant. So that's bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top. Here I take the literal top times the derivative of the bottom, derivative of the bottom with respect to x is y. And then I divide by the bottom squared. Now, I think I've got some simplifying I can do here. So actually I'm gonna take this over here and simplify it. So uh, 
let's just write this out carefully, 3x cubed y minus x cubed y minus y to the fourth divided by x squared y squared. Keep simplifying by bringing these two objects together. Let me tear off this paper so I can move it more easily. And that gives me two x cubed y. I am missing some y's. Am I? No, no, I'm missing I'm okay. Minus y fourth or x squared y squared. And now I'm ready for the final presentation. Partial f, partial x. I hope we're doing this correctly. Let's just, I don't want to screw this up now. So bottom times derivative of the top minus top times derivative of the bottom, standard quotient stuff, bottom squared, got it. And this is three x cubed y, got it. X cubed y, got it. Minus y fourth, got it. But, and this, this looks kind of generic here, but I want you to see the symmetry that each term on the top has a single y. So I'm gonna cancel that y out in the bottom. That leaves me with x squared y on the bottom. But now when I cancel out this y right here, I can't factor it out anymore. One y is gone. I really have two x cubed minus y cubed. So there's partial f partial x. And by the way, I now know partial f partial y. How did I write that down so quickly? Now let's think about this because you don't always get this break, but here you get this break because we're in a special situation. What did I do from there to there? Did I do all that work immediately in my head? No, after you look at it for a second, wait a minute, he switched every X into a Y and every Y into an X. Yes. Do you look at this surface right here? And do you see perfect symmetry? And that is, if I switch the x's and y's right now in front of your eyes, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference, right? Let me quickly cover up the expression. Take my other hand in here and switch the x's and y's. Oh, well, it's the same expression. So with respect to x or y, this is symmetrical function. And so if I differentiate with respect to X or Y, you literally can't tell the difference in a sense. The only result would be switching the X's and Y's. So you go and do DF DY right now. You go and do partial F partial Y, you'll find out it's this expression right here. Now let's talk about at X not Y not equals one, two. And so now partial F, partial x at one, two is, now we got to plug in one and two really carefully. So we got two times one, two minus eight, negative six, bottom one, two is two. So I think I got negative six over, oh, okay, let me, I'll check my denominator in a second. Thank you very much. Uh, I got negative six over two negative three. And I will address your question. Thank you. You did spot a problem, but I'm going to use the standard math teacher scam to get out of this. If I put in the one, two over here, what do I get? I get two minus eight. Again, it's not, ah, I got four on that. I got to be careful with this. Yeah, so I'm do I trying to do two things at once, aren't I? Say, I don't get the same number. You promised me symmetry. Why don't I get the same number? But let's think about this. Carefully put in the one or two. I have confidence in the derivative. Let's put in the one for x and the two for y. And what I get on the top is two times eight, 16 minus one. That's 15. On the bottom, I get one times four, 15 over four. What happened to my symmetry? 
Well, the problem is the derivatives are symmetrical, but the point I used is not symmetrical. Now let's go back and address your observation. You're completely correct. In the original problem, there was a three here. And so I should be dividing by three x, y. So I'm going to do the standard math teacher cop out since I haven't damaged anything else. And if I'm faced with an ugly fact, I will destroy the fact. <laughs> okay, now there's no more three. And now these derivatives are correct. So I apologize for distracting you with that. Okay, so now we're gonna go to the tangent plane, C minus C naught. And I'm gonna not write this out every single time I use this, but I'll write it out once just so you see me assembling the pieces. You know, when I got my crazy automatic lights gonna go off on me in a second, so. I apologize, lights go off, so I have to like wave my arms and do calisthenics. Get the lights to come back on, my apologies. So here's a tangent plane formula, right? So let's just put in the one, two, the one, the two, the numbers, right? I'm not going to rewrite this expression. I'm going to put in these numbers that I calculated. And Z naught was three halves. You know, since I changed that function there, I might have to change the output right here. So I don't think this three halves is going to work anymore. Let's put in one and two on the left side and the right side and see what I get. What I get is one plus eight is nine. One times two is two. Two Z is nine. If two Z is nine, then Z is nine over two. So if I alter the problem, I have to alter all aspects of the problem. So I'll do Z minus nine over two is equal to negative three times X minus one plus 15 quarters times Y minus two. I mean, we are gonna have to do a mock-up of this to see if it actually works, right? So this is a tangent plane. Now I fully understand that I've asked you to write all your planes in standard form. So let's see if we can do that. That is minus three X plus 15 force Y. If I bring the z over to the other side, minus one z. Then I try to collect all the numbers on the other side. That means I'll take plus three right here and bring it to the other side. Minus nine halves, minus three. Sorry, I have to move the paper up. What do I got right here? Minus 15 halves. If I slide that over to the other side, it's plus 15 halves. So what's the total damage right here? Uh, this is not necessarily what I expected, but we'll find out if it's true when we go and check it, right? Six over two, nine over two, 15 over two negative plus 15 over two positive, that's equal to zero. So this is a tangent plane. This is fully the tangent plane. It's in a method that emphasizes the point one, two, and nine halves. But if I want to present in standard form, remember I told you to lead with a positive and to not use fractions. So in standard form, this tangent plane would be multiply everybody by negative four, 12 X's minus 15 y's plus four z's is zero. So now I think it's time to go and check out if that really works. Now I could check out, first of all, if I still keep my point right here, this is one in here, two in here, nine halves in here. 
So this gives me 12 minus 30. What's 12 minus 30? 18 negative. And four times nine halves is 18 positive. So that's certainly zero. So this plane certainly shares the point of the surface. But is this plane tangent to the surface? Let's open it up and check it out with a simple calculation. Remember, I've drawn the tangent plane, and that's also the differential and the linear approximation. I'll write it in those forms in a second. So I open up a Mathematica window. I'm going to go share that. When I go share screen, and the problem is sometimes I kill the, it kills the chat box. I have to make sure I can leave that open all the time. So excuse me if I don't catch your chats immediately. But let's put in this function, uh, f of, I'll pop up the size of this font in a second, of x comma y underscore stop equals x raised to the three plus y raised to the three. We'll get some parentheses in there, get rid of that extra letter, divided by x, y, not x, y, the variable, x times y in parentheses. Okay, so that's an appropriate way to express this. Yeah, let's leave it that tall. Bring it down here where you can read it and insert that. Now let's do the surface and the tangent plane. So I'll do a quick surface. I won't try to decorate this too much. Equals plot 3D. This plane, this surface could be weird. So I'm going to have to allow for that. We might have to control something. F of x comma y. Anytime you divide by something, you're opening yourself up to undefined places, right? And our point was at one, two, and nine halves. So let's go plus or minus one, plus or minus one, plus or minus one in each direction. So that is x equals zero to two. And then y equals one to three. And then z equals seven halves to 11 halves. Got it. Okay, I don't want this to be printed out yet, so I'm going to suppress with a semicolon, and then I'm going to do my plane. And the plane, I'll use contour plot 3D and the standard form of the plane that we discovered. And the standard form of the plane we discovered was 12x. Minus 15y. I want to see if my simplified version presents the plane nicely because there are still reasons why standard form is the best way to present a plane. Equals zero. And then I have to give an x, y, and z block. I'll give the same x, y, and z block I did above. Now, something bad going to happen when I do this. Maybe you already anticipate what that is. But I'm going to do show. Uh, Surface. Notice Mathematica did not try to uh, fill in those variables for me because the variables are still blue. The variables haven't been executed. I put this all in one cell so it could execute everything at once with one click. Okay, so beyond position. So I get multiple errors right here. Let's gonna have to work them out. Options expected instead of beyond position three blah, blah, blah. And it's in plot 3D that the error is, and then it couldn't show it. So let's go back to plot 3D and see exactly what's happening. Yes, I only have to specify two variables for the raw plot 3D. Maybe later I'll specify a range. Let's try again. Okay, here is the surface. I am not looking. Is that a tangent plane or not? 
very hard to tell in the situation because it seems like the surface is so very slight. And then beyond that, the surface has a problem with x equals zero, which is understandable. Let's get away from x equals zero. So let's tighten this up quite a bit. Let's tighten this up to maybe, uh, I don't know if I wanna go this tight, but first of all, let's put a 0 0.1 to get rid of the zero. I still have a large part of this displayed. Notice the extreme height here, 20, is because the cubes on top are growing very large. So let's cut the windows down to one unit in each direction. Try to control the height. And then let's take the same things for this expression. And then let's cut this down to, this was one away from nine halves. So I want to subtract a half again. So I want to run this from four to five. That's one unit long centered at that point. Okay, so now I'm getting this and I still don't feel super comfortable about that tangent object. And, and see, Mathematica is not excited about this either because of the way that this is touching right here at this point. So this is so slight at that point right there. How do I know that that's a good linear approximation? I could try to change the colors on this. I could try to share the point value. The point value was one, two, and four and a half. So I could add a point here, but this is so subtle. It's hard to see the tangent plane coming in right here. And, you know, it looks like this plane is simultaneously below and above this surface. So mathematics is having a hard time drawing this super accurately. So is there anything else we can do to verify that I have this tangent plane right here? I could try to cut away some of this largeness here. I could try to make this box expand in the vertical direction. So let's do that with, uh, see if we can do box ratios on this. And box ratios might be out of place right here but let's say first one to one to one. Okay, that gave me something, a little more definition to it. And right there, let me see if I can add the point. I'm gonna make this smaller and see if I can add the point. The problem is I always forget the command for point. So let's say uh, point equals uh, list point plot 3D. I think that's it. And let's add the point. And the point was one comma two comma nine halves. Good. And let's make that point plot style. is both red and thickness is significant. So let's say 0 0.1, that's probably too thick. And then let me add that to my drawing. I may not get a fully satisfied drawing, not a valid data set, list plot point 3D, so not a valid data set. So why is it not a valid data set? Because I'm using a bad option. It doesn't seem to like this option thickness. So let's take out the thickness for a second and just say point style red. Not a valid data set right there. Okay, so I think I have to enclose this in a list. That's what it wanted. Okay, so now let's put back the thickness. List plot, list point plot 3D makes you enclose the points in a list, even if it's a single. 
point. So this is a good mathematical demonstration day. Let's try that out. Okay, bigger point. We'll see what happens. And let's put the point in there. Let's kill that presentation. There's that point right there on the surface. And this is very hard to judge because Mathematica is having a hard time drawing that tangent plane nicely. This is actually a legitimate tangent plane. And you see how, as I rotate this, Mathematica from different angles makes it look like it captures more or less, but it looks like it's simultaneously above and below the surface but it looks like a good tangent plane. And sometimes the mesh is coming through on both sides. I think what I could do to make this better, and I don't think I'm gonna invest the time here, is probably work in some transparency, but probably try harder to draw this tangent plane with a better parameterization. Right now it's coming across as a tangent strip, which is not super effective. But let's go back to our calculations here to show you some more things. Okay, so let's just call this a fair picture, not a great picture, but it's a fair picture. It's not an easy function. Large growth in the top, holes punched in the bottom, right? Okay, so now we have our surface. Let me move this up and go to the next sheet. So we have surface. which is z equals x cubed plus y cubed. This is page three today, not a lot of pages today, divided by x, y, and the point, he didn't call it p naught, but we can say p naught, because we've changed this point. This is still 117, but now it's 117 alt, because I actually changed the problem. And we have our tangent plane, And by the book, the formula is nine minus, or series, z minus nine halves equals minus three times x minus one plus 15 fourths times y minus two. Now in our standard form, remember we present that as 12x minus 15y plus four z equals zero. Now I'm going to write the differential. See if I can give you an example of how to use that. So this is the dz equals minus 3 dx plus 15 fourths dy. And I'll also write this in the form of linear approximation. Uh, let's see what's going on. Okay, I had some problems with people popping in and out of here, so I apologize if this didn't work nicely. So linear approximation, remember, is to say I bring the nine halves over to the other side. That's the Z naught. Plus partial F, partial X. That's a change in x plus partial f partial y times a change in y. And that I present as its own function, the linear function that approximates the original function at p naught. Okay, so these three things are the same. Tangent plane, differential, and linear approximation. So let me see if I can show you how to use this. What if the question was, how does
the value of F change. as we change from P naught to P, let's say P is 0 0.9, 2.1 and uh, 4.7. Now remember P naught was 1.0, 2.0 and 4.5. So I'm moving from this point to that point, and I want to know how the value of F changes. Well, that's literally a question for the differential, how the value of F, remember Z equals F of X, Y. So I've changed X by what? Subtracting one tenth. I've changed Y by what? adding one tenth. I've changed Z, oh, sorry. We'll just go from that point to that point. We'll not bring in the Z right now because I've only got a function of two variables. I've just changed X and Y by one tenth and minus one tenth. Minus one tenth for the X, one tenth for the Y. Excuse me. So how does that predict how Z changes? Well, that's the quick and dirty differential, minus three times minus one tenth and plus 15 fourths times one tenth. This estimates how much that function changes. This is three tenths plus 15 forties. And if we get common denominator here, multiplied by four and four, 12, 15, 2740s. And 2740s, we could estimate, is a number, I'm going to say 2.5. Ah. I don't always keep the calculator handy, but let's just say calculator here 27 divided by 40. Clear out the calculator 27 divided by 40. 0 0.675. Our quick and dirty estimate right here is that we have raised the value of the function by 0 0.675. Now remember, I have the actual function value. So I could see what happens if I plug in 0 0.9 and qubit plus 2.1 and qubit. And divide by 0 0.9 times 2.1. And then I could subtract from that where I used to be, one cubed plus two cubed divided by one times two. Well, you see, this is the actual change in F. This is the actual change, right? But look at the actual change compared to the estimated change. The differential gave me a quick answer. This is going to give me a lot of pain. I'll take it to the Mathematica notebook and work it out. Not that I couldn't work out this one. Say, here I have one plus eight. I have nine over two. I knew what that was going to be, but I really don't want to calculate this with my bare hands. Let's take it back to the Mathematica notebook. Not interested in the picture right now, but I do have the function already built in at the top, right? So I could take the function, evaluate it at, excuse me, function, evaluate it at 1.9 and 2.1. I could take, I don't need to separate these, but I just want to show you what the numbers turn out to be. Uh, 0 0.9, 2.1, 1 comma 2. And then I could subtract those two. So this is a 0 0.9. And then I could subtract those two. F of 0 0.9 comma 2.1 minus F of 1 comma 2. 
I just want to show you that one comma two f one comma two is three halves. Is nine halves? Excuse me. So here's some interesting things about Mathematica. So the value at 0.9 and 2.1 actually turns out to be 5.28. So this is an approximation. The value one, two, we knew was nine halves. So what's the difference? What's the true difference? Seven, eight, five, seven. And we said 0.675. Now that's not too bad of an approximation. You say, well, that's not a very excellent approximation. Well, 0.1 and 0.1 are farther away from that point right there. So vision going a tenth of a unit in both the X and Y direction, you're not going to be on the surface at the same height you are in the tangent plane. But the 0.675 was a fair instruction. Also, this is interesting, notice this. When you give Mathematica decimals, it responds to you in decimals. When you give Mathematica whole numbers, it responds to you in whole numbers. So actually I could have had exact answers for Mathematica if I had put in exact descriptions, non-decimal descriptions. I'm just curious what that would look like in this case. See, now Mathematica responds exactly. 11 fourteenths is the change. And we said the change was 27 over 40. A 27 over 40, 0.675, 11 fourteen is 0.7857, it or something like that, right? So the differential gives me a fair approximation. If I was even closer to that point, if I was, I'll go back to my paper now, you know, 0.99 and 2.03. then the difference between my tangent line approximation between the differential and the actual change would be much, much smaller. So I'll just write down, that you have to calculate this in a machine of some kind. So tangent plane differential linear approximation are exactly all the same thing. So, Let's go back to the top because we got to wrap it up now. If these three things really represent the same thing, the change in the function, then how do they combine? Tell us what is or is not differentiable. And the problem is we're going to have a very hard time defining what is or is not differentiable if we only had the tools that were available to us right now. I can give you a simple test for differentiability, which we're about to write down right now. It comes from the section 4.4 in your book. But we cannot characterize differentiability exactly yet. So the test that I'm gonna write down is famous test from theorem 4.7. I'm gonna switch this paper. And this is going to be what we're going to end up. So how close does all of this, and I mean the tangent plane, the differential, and the linear approximation. These are all the same thing, three faces of the same thing, three different presentations, but essentially the same idea. How close to all this come? To characterizing, to exactly describing, characterizing differentiability. And what you have is this famous one-sided theorem in mathematics, which the authors present as theorem 4.7. And it says, if z equals f of xy, has 
partial f partial x and partial f partial y continuous in an entire neighborhood of point x not y not then choosing colors for a reason f of x y is differentiable at x not y not so let me explain why I chose the colors here and why I chose the words I did, and that will wrap it up for today. So characterizing differentiability means like this is the exact way to describe it, and we can't do that. What I can give you, and that's what this is called, this is a test for differentiability. It says if you have this, then you know your function is differentiable, but even if you don't necessarily have this, your function might still be differentiable for some other conditions. So it says that partial derivatives have to exist. Now, earlier we said, wait a minute, differentiable does not mean has a derivative. So what does it mean? The partial derivatives have to exist. That's the minimum you require for a tangent plane. And they have to be continuous at that point and around that point. In other words, these partial derivatives have to be existing and predictable, not just at that point, but in the whole area around that point. If you have that, then you have a unique and effective tangent line. If you have this, then the function's differentiable at that point. Notice it does not say that if it's differentiable, then you have this. That would be a characterization of differentiability. This is only a test for differentiability. Notice also that it does not say this. What is the derivative? It doesn't say what the derivative is. It just says the function is differentiable. In that case, the derivative, the closest way we can come to describe it is the tangent plane is the linear approximation. So outright, we're not going to often or hardly at all ask you if a function is differentiable unless we allow you to use this test. Right now, today in this section, I only want you to practice constructing the tangent line, the differential, and the linear approximation. By the way, we did it for a function of two variables but we can also say the same thing for three or more variables just by adding extra terms. Okay, that was kind of dense, not entirely satisfying because of the nature of what differentiable is. But practice executing tangent planes, differentials, linear approximations, and see that they all represent the same object and become fluent in the language of doing problems with that object. We're going to cut it off right here. First, I'm going to